Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're continuing on in our study in the Epistle to Titus, verse by verse. I believe in the last video um, we covered the first uh, several, two or three verses. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just thank you again for the opportunity that you've given us to feast upon your word. I ask that you would filter out all of the foolishness, all the error, but just seal to our hearts only that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. I received a question uh, earlier today I wanted to include in this, in this video that had to do with uh, my statement recently about the mysterious third person, which is really not so mysterious after all, really, and maybe I shouldn't have phrased it that way. Uh, when I refer to the third person, I'm simply talking about you and me. I'm talking about us, the essential us. You know, we are the third person. Uh, when I talk about uh, us being a single-natured individual, uh, as or a, a, excuse me, when I talk about us being a dual-natured individual, not a single-natured individual, which is basically what uh, Christianity in the main today, uh, that's the position that they hold to, that we are just a single-natured individual, uh, which is not biblically correct. We are a dual-natured uh, creature, uh, dual-natured, two-natured individual, but we're neither one of those other two natures. We are in possession of an old man and a new man, and both of those natures, the old and the new, are bound by their nature. They can only do what they do. On the other hand, uh, and this is what makes it cl clear, to, to in, at least in my mind, and easy to understand how that we cannot be our new man. We're, we're certainly not our old man. We're, we're not even really, our, are we, is it said that we are a, our new man? What Scripture says is we are a new creation in possession of both an old and a new man. The old man, we know, can do nothing but sin. If we were our old man, then we would have no capability whatsoever of doing anything good or anything righteous. In fact, we wouldn't be a new creation in Christ if we were our old man. The totally depraved individual who is unregenerate, who's not born again, who can do nothing but sin, whose worship is sin, whose plowing is sin, they are a single-natured individual. And we know that, that in the flesh dwells no good thing. They are incapable of doing anything good. But we are a new creation, so we've been made a new creation, and we've been given a new man, a sinless new man, uh, who cannot sin. The new, the new man cannot sin. It's not capable of sinning. Whereas all the old man does is sin, the new man can do nothing but righteousness. It's perfect. The new man is perfect. But we are not the new man. Uh, we are obviously not perfect. Sometimes we sin. If we say that we have no sin in us, we lie and we deceive ourselves. And so we are an individual that is, we are a new creation who is in possession of both an old and a new man, which are bound by their own uh, nature. They can only do what they do. And so this is contrasted between uh, the conflict there between the old and the new is a very real conflict. The old man and new man are in constant conflict with one another. We are not in conflict with either. We as that third person, we as essentially individuals are not in conflict with either one. We're not in conflict with the old man because we're, we are not separate from, distinct uh, from our new man. Uh, we're not absent of a new man. So we're not trying to clean up the flesh. We're not trying to clean up the old man. Uh, it's not that we want one thing and the old man wants another. And neither are we our new man in the sense that, that we have a con we don't have we certainly don't have a conflict with the new man. In fact, we delight in the law in the law of God in the inward man, and so we don't we don't have a conflict with either one. But the other, but the the two, the old man and the new, are in constant conflict. 
Now this is contrasted between law and grace, uh, flesh and spirit. We, the third person, can choose to walk in the flesh or in the spirit. We, the third p person, can choose to live under, under the law or under grace. And we do that daily. We, in, in fact, we make daily choices which determine whether or not we are going to be walking in the spirit or in the flesh. And it has nothing to do with law keeping. It has nothing, absolutely nothing to do with law keeping. We are not under law, we're under grace. We died to the law in order that we might bear fruit unto God. And so when, when we, by cho but what I mean by choosing to walk in the spirit is walking in, the, in His works, the finished work of Christ. We, we walk in grace. We don't walk, walk in, in law. Flesh equals law. Flesh and law are married to one another. You can't really separate the two. If we're walking according to the flesh, it, it's, not, it's not that we're just, uh, you know, going to the bar, beer joint or we're just, you know, uh, just name anything, you know, any characteristic of the flesh. It's not we're participating in all those activities that are uh, basically characteristic of the flesh. To walk in the flesh, folks, is to walk under law because the law is the strength of sin. Where sin gets its strength, its power, is in the law. Why? It's it's not that the law is, is there's anything wrong with the law. The law is... Is, is good, the law is just, the law is holy. It's, it's just that we ourselves are incapable of keeping the law. The law was never given to the believer in Christ. And so we, as a third person, we can be involved in that which is according to the faith of God's elect. It's a very particular faith. As I pointed out in my previous video, uh, Paul, a servant of God, that, it, that is, he was born a slave of God. And I want you to take note of the fact that Paul was, is set forth as an example to us who would believe. So we also were born as a slave of God. The word slave there, uh, to, uh, doulos, as I pointed out, is one that's used in the, in the, in, in the New Testament of one who was born into slavery. Paul was born a slave of God. Okay? He was an apostle, one who was sent, according to the faith of God's elect. That's, that is a particular faith. That's the faith that we're to contend earnestly for. In the original text, it shows that it's, it's according to faith, uh, the faith of God's elect, and I have no problem with that being our faith because given the fact that we can't separate our faith from God's faithfulness, true faith trusts God that he's faithful. So, you know, what is our faith if it's not trusting that God is faithful? And the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness, and that is such a powerful statement because what it says is, is it says we acknowledge that truth, that godliness is a result of truth, biblical truth, doctrine. Doctrine leads to godliness, not law. It's, it's truth that transforms our lives, not law. In hope of eternal life, that is zoe, life, it's the quality of life, not the as much, it's not speaking as much about the duration of of eternity, uh, eternal life in the sense of, of quantity, but the quality of life that we now have, not, not that we're going to have it someday, but, but that we now have that is guaranteed expectation. Hope in Scripture is guaranteed expectation. It's not wishful thinking, which God who cannot lie promised before the world began. And, and I suggested that this was a promise that I believe was promised to Christ but hath in due times, that is, at the appropriate time, in due time, his proper time, his designed time. You know, and I suppose it's, you know, one could ask, well, why did he wait so long? I mean, so many years since Adam to Christ. 
could have been at any time in history that Christ came into the world, but it was at, at the proper time. Just as the rapture is at, will be at the proper time, and just as every event that occurs in your life is at, occurs at the proper time. So, so that statement has heavy theological implications as well. Manifested, that is, made known His Word through preaching. The, the word is, means a proclamation. His Word through preaching. You know, you know, you know, you'd think that He would have said manifested Himself, but Christ is the Word. And, and folks, we tend to look everywhere for evidence of God except through His Word, except through preaching. The Holy Spirit appears to be emphasizing the need to study in the preaching of His Word. And no wonder, because it is the truth which is after godliness. And, and I want you to hold that thought in mind as we go down through this, these next few verses. Paul says, which is committed, that is entrusted unto me. That's particular to, to Paul. But is that only true of Paul? Well, I don't think so, you know. Timothy was called an apostle, as were others. According to the commandment of, that is the authority of, the word, the word there uh, carries the, the connotation of, of authoritativeness. Paul was sent to the Gentiles. So the first three verses that we looked at, those are Paul's credentials to those at Crete. And he goes on, God our, God our Savior, our God and our Deliverer, Savior, that's Sozo. It's from the word Sozo, Deliverer. He didn't say God our Redeemer, God our Savior, and Deliverer, God our Deliverer, to Titus, my own son, that is God's child, through Paul's preaching. I think God wants us to know more than than just that, that Paul uh, converted Titus, but that he was God's child. Titus is a genuine son of God. A position of reference, which I believe we'll see reinforced later when it comes to elders as well as their children, after the common faith, that is, that, that's the, that faith which we all share, common faith. The common faithfulness of God. That's neither Jew nor Gentile, slave or free, all one in Christ. This is saying that all of these people are the same in God's eyes. All have received grace, mercy, and peace. And people, people, folks today, they ought to know these precious truths. Grace, mercy, and peace. There's not a believer that has not received grace, mercy, and peace. No conflict exists between you and God. I don't care how many preachers tell you otherwise. Constant, there is a constant conflict between the old man and the new man, as I pointed out here just previously. So this applies to the Cretans as well as to the Jews, the slaves, and the free, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So we see His deity there, that Jesus is God, and again, our Savior, Deliverer, and this verse 5, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I had appointed thee. And many of the commentators say, well, this is because, the, you know, there were things that were really out of order there in Crete, and, and Titus had to straighten them out. I don't believe that the text is saying that there were problems in Crete that had to be resolved by Titus. He was to set in order the things that, that were yet to be done. I believe that's what our text is saying. Older men, pres, presbuteros is the word uh, there, Older men. I don't believe that, that females are elected to a position 
of presbyteros. Okay? You know, it's, it's difficult to call a woman an old man. You know, it's bad enough to call her an old woman. The text is saying that they're not controlled by some power above them, like some organization, like the, you know, s Southern whatever denomination, convention, or whatever. They're not controlled by any power above them other than God Almighty. And I believe God will fulfill His promise, city by city, church by, by church, <coughs> YouTube channel by YouTube channel. We've just recently uh, established a, a board of elders for this ministry. So I have someone to be accountable to. I'm, I'm nobody's guru. So I believe that he's gifted certain older men to serve in that capacity, whom we could say, like Titus, are after the common faith. And we, so that brings us to verse 6. It's a first-class condition. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children not accused of riot or unruly, since there are some that are blameless. That's what the text says, folks. Uh, for you Greek students out there who are more familiar with the first class condition, I've talked about that uh, often. It's where that you have the word uh, sentence beginning with if, but it's followed by a verb in the indicative mood. So you, you have every right to translate it since. Since there are some that are blameless. That's what the text is saying. Now, what if there aren't any? What if there aren't any blameless? Well, if, if there are some that are not blameless, then there, there's not a local fellowship. And again, whom we could say, like Titus, or after the common faith. The text is clearly, as clearly as I know how to say it, God is putting himself on record saying that in a local fellowship, there are men who meet these qualifications. There, there will be. That's why it's a first-class condition. Such people exist. If any be blameless, the word there is, uh, I believe it's uh, anenkletos, anenkletos. It's, a, it's an interesting word. Uh, interesting in the sense that, uh, well, in, in our country, anybody can file charges against anybody. You know, I know many of our viewers are scattered all over. Here in the U.S., you can file charges against anybody. I had a, I had a close friend years ago. He's, he's now gone on to be with the Lord. He was a pastor as well as a pilot, and he was, he was arrested for flying too low to the ground one time. He went to court. They, to make a long story short, he was acquitted. Uh, he had permission, written documents proving that he had permission to fly low to the ground the case was thrown out the judge kind of got a little irritated because he thought that it was a, had wasted the, the the court's time uh, apparently his attorney didn't introduce that evidence until later uh, so it was thrown out because he was discovered that he had permission to do that i remember the headlines in the paper really big huge print read minister arrested for flying too low in the heavens So anybody can bring a charge against somebody. It doesn't mean that they're guilty, though. And that's not this word. This is a word that says a charge can be brought and substantiated. The word, the, it mean, the word means that they, they may have charges brought against them, you know, sort of like, uh, like a grand jury that examines the evidence and then discovers there's not enough evidence to, to bring an indictment. Anenkletos. There are those older men in the fellowship, but you can't bring a charge against and support it. You can't substate. You can't support. You can't prove your case against them. Now I believe that's that's only because they are blameless, as every believer is blameless before Christ. I believe Jesus Christ is our advocate. 
You know, if, if you went back to the Old Testament, you wouldn't find very many saints, if, if any at all, that would qualify over here, here in Titus here as, being, as qualifying for being elders. 1 Timothy 3 or, or, or here in verse 6. And the text does not say that a man has to be married. Okay? I think the text says if he's an older man, a one-woman type man, you know, he might have had other wives in the past, but he, he's not a man who, who enters into casual relationships with women. He's not a womanizer. Now, some people take that as, well, he, he's, he's got to be married, and he has to have only been married one time. And I don't think that's what the text is teaching at all. The expression here is an, it's an adjective describing an individual who is a one-woman type man, and that I, that I believe is the sense of the text. And as you know, I don't I don't ask anyone to agree with me on anything. But but I do not believe that the text allows us to say that he can only be one who's been married only once in all his life. What it does say. I believe, is that he's faithful to his wife. And he has children who believe. That is, they're not pagan children. And again, of whom we could say, like Titus, are after the common faith. And it's his children who are not accused of being riotous or unruly. In other words, they're not, they're not accused of public disorder, which is what those words mean. That, that has nothing to do with... with it's not a critical examination of every aspect of theology. It's like my daughter may not believe something uh, that I believe. We, no, we may not uh, have something theologically in common. We may differ on when their rapture occurs or, or baptism or something else. It's not a critical examination of every aspect of theology. But they are believers. I mean, we don't even have to agree with one another on everything. So an elder and his children don't have to agree with every, with each other on everything. This is what I believe we're seeing here. And the modification in the grammar is to children, not the husband, or not to, not to the bishop. Now, who is blameless, folks? Who is blameless? Well, I mean, those who do better, work harder at it, somehow get... Uh, are fortunate enough to have uh, somehow overcome the flesh through their own ability uh, a little better than others, or, or you know, who is blameless? Well, Ephesians 1, 4, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. That's how we stand before God. Colossians 1, but now he's reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you wholly unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. That's how he sees every one of his children. I think the text is saying that unregenerate elders don't rule very well, and neither do those who are not spiritually mature. If you wanted to take it that far, which, is, which I do, that is mature in the sense that they've learned to discern between good and evil. They realize that they stand before God wholly unblameable and unreprovable in His sight. And I believe that the elders of this ministry believe just that. Those who are walking, living according to the Spirit, not the flesh, which is law. Verse 7, For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre. And again, we see the word blameless. I want you to note, I want you to note here, folks, that there is not a single Old Testament saint, not a single one, except maybe with the exception of Daniel, and I'm not really sure of him, that meets the requirements of Titus 1 or 1 Timothy 3 in the general frame of reference. 
Not meaning to jump ahead, but, but if you look at verse 8, we see the words just and holy. Okay, and, and twice here we've seen the word blameless. Who is blameless? All those who are in Christ. I'm going to suggest that what appears to be law in these verses is not law. It's not all, all of a sudden now they have to, to, be, to earn this position through human merit. Please, please catch that point if you don't catch anything else in this video. These elders, these bishops do not earn that position through some miraculous ability of, the, of their own. They don't earn it through law, merit, law-keeping. Not at all. We're not looking at law, okay? I'm going to suggest that what appears to be law in these verses is not law. It cannot be law. It is not law, given the fact that we are not under law, but grace. Therefore, 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 they're the natural result of what appears in a believer's life or an elder's life under grace. Therefore, we are looking at older men, mature men, spiritually mature men who are growing in grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And again, I don't, I don't agree anyone, I don't ask that anyone agree with me on this or anything else. But this is what I see in the text. Though, though, these are those who are not driven by the impulses of the flesh, dominated, ruled over by the lusts of the flesh, and we know that the law is the strength of sin. Folks, I, I, I guess I could just really cut it down to the bone here and say I don't think that the Holy Spirit is showing us that law keepers those who walk according to the flesh, who are living under the law, are qualified to be elders. Okay? That's, that's what I'm seeing. That's what I'm seeing. And no wonder. I mean, why would God consider them to be of, uh, of uh, worthy, you know, uh, to, to serve in that capacity as, as those who who govern over the direction of a ministry, who preside over, who manage the household of God. Of course, that makes no sense at all. The word there for steward is manager. In the Greek, it means manager, one who, who often functioned in, as, a, as the steward of a household. And get this, 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 according to the word, he was generally a freedman. That is, he was a slave released from forced legal servitude and, and just fits right along with what I just got through saying. A steward. Self-willed, that's a Greek word that, that means to gratify self, be indulgent, a person who gratifies self, one who is engrossed in self. And again, we see, you know, I can't help but see law there in that. Self as opposed to Christ. Remember, truth which is after godliness, first verse. And anger is a word meaning prone to anger, one who harbors resentment. It's kind of like, I'm going to pay you back. You do something to me, I'm going to do it back to you. Long-standing anger, prejudice, bitterness, uh, punitive. And the word occurs only here in Titus 1.7. Given to wine, that's a word meaning a drunken, abusive person. Striker means a quarrelsome, abusive person. And, of course, filthy lucre, that's greedy of base gain. Now, folks, these are all characteristics of the flesh. It is, it is necessary that those in charge of a church not be given to such things. And how are these things going to come about? These, peop, these individuals are not... If, if elders of this nature, okay, managed a household of God, well, a little leaven leavens the whole lump, the entire ministry is going to become one of law, 
legalism, human merit. That's what I'm seeing in the text. We're, to, we're told in 1 Corinthians 14, let all things be done decently and in order. That's not law. That's just good advice. Faith, folks, faith. According to the, you know, faith, the common faith. Okay, faith, folks, is God's gift. Ephesians 1, chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. We see faith as God's gift. It's not something that we drum up on our own. We manufacture on our own. Believing is the consequence of my using His gift. And if it were true, if it were true that God had elected certain ones to be saved because, because in due time they would believe. He looked down in, in history and he saw, well, they're going to believe, so I'm going to elect them. If, if that was the case, then that would make believing a meritorious act. And in that event, the saved sinner would have ground for boasting, which Scripture emphatically denies. Ephesians chapter 2. You know, that, that, folks, that's like me saying, you know, if you love me, I'll love you. That's like me telling Sue, you know, if you love me, I'll love you. Or me telling my children, you know, I'll love you as long as you're good. If, or if, if you do what I say, I'll love you. If you don't, I won't. Surely God's Word is plain enough in teaching that believing is not a meritorious act. If you don't believe that, folks, I, look, it, it affirms that Christians are a people who have believed through grace. Believed through grace. Your belief came through grace. It didn't come through any other means but grace. Acts chapter 18, verse 27, we read concerning Apollos. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, to receive Apollos, who when, his, when he was come, helped them much, which had believed through grace. You see the phrase used there in Acts chapter 18, believed through grace. If you go over to Philippians chapter 1, verse 29, we see the same thing. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. R read the words carefully. Unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him. Faith is a gift. Faith is not something that you drummed up on your own. So, if then they have believed through grace, if we have believed through grace, then there's absolutely nothing meritorious about believing. And if nothing meritorious, then it, it, it cannot be. It could not be the ground or cause which moved God to choose us. No. God's choice proceeds not from anything in us or anything from us, but solely from His own sovereign pleasure, His good will and His pleasure. And if we don't begin with a proper understanding of, of these things, these important doctrines, understanding of grace, election, faith, if we don't begin to comprehend what is being said here, then we're not going to do very well in, in interpreting this. What we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to if, if, we, if we play light with the Scripture, folks, what we're going to do is we're going to wind up being down here assigning elders that believe that, that we, we, are, we are saved by what we do, that, that we earn favor, God's favor, by what we do. Uh, a completely different system a merit system, a religious system based on human merit that I've been talking about for so long, which is what we see for the most part in the main in Christianity today. Now well, these are these are these are good people. I've known a lot of them. Nice nice folks. They'll they'll hug your neck. They'll shake your hand. 
and then and then they'll tell you that as an elder of 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 this church, uh, you need to keep your mouth shut about this all this election and and gift grace being a gift and all this all this all this grace stuff. You know that's just not what we teach here. And Paul's his reason he left Titus and Crete was to set in order the things that were wanting. Look, that's it. I'm out of time. I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, rest in Him, and thanks for watching.